A few months ago, I had a great conversation with Jeff Turner of Dunsky, but unfortunately, we had audio troubles. I don't know what happened, but we had to take that podcast down, and Jeff graciously agreed to re record today's session. So, today, we're going to continue talking about EVs and EV adoption, things like barriers to the adoption side of things, but also how to turn gas powered fleets into electric ones and how the grid has to get ready and how this all has to become a strategy of some sorts. Jeff is going to talk about electric vehicles and how they have different usage types. Say for example, fire trucks and ferries or even vehicles have just have different uses and different purposes. So we're gonna understand these profiles a little bit better and how to better develop better EV strategies. So get ready again for Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining me again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Well, let's hear about your background. I mean, you've got a really great, you know, um, industry experience, you know, in, in the energy field. So what led you to Dunsky? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and actually, yeah, my, my career in electric mobility started way back in 2005. I was uh, an undergrad student. I was still a student at the time, but that's when I first got into this uh, exciting space. Um, uh, some friends of mine invited me to come help them work on an electric snowmobile project mm -hmm. at McGill University, studying mechanical engineering. And uh, yeah, it was, there was a student design competition organized by the Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, a bunch of other Canadian and U.S. universities were building mm -hmm. gas-powered snowmobiles that were, you know, maybe a bit cleaner and quieter. They had catalytic converters, things like that. Yeah. And McGill was the first school to show up with a fully electric snowmobile. And so we were kind of off the charts on a lot of the, the competition metrics and things like yeah. that. But uh, yeah, so that was the start. And it's really amazing to think back to then when electric vehicles were very much more of a, a science project. Uh, had a lot of fun building prototype vehicles and racing them and things like that. But, uh, but then, yeah, since then, I've had a chance to work for companies that were selling electric vehicles, uh, designing them, uh, both in London, UK, and out in Vancouver. Uh, and then I also had a chance to work for BC Hydro uh, from 2012 to 2016. Um, yeah, working on the first public charging infrastructure that was going into the ground back then. We had a network of 30 fast chargers for EVs and 500 level two chargers. And yeah, it gave me a chance to really see what it's like to put this infrastructure in the ground, yeah. testing out different technologies, um, including a lot of, uh, you know, things that'll help utilities handle the growing load on the grid and things like that. Um, but yeah, and then I joined the team at Dunsky in 2017. And up to that point, uh, Dunsky had been around since the early 2000s, doing a lot of work on energy efficiency and buildings and renewable energy. And I helped the company dive into uh, the wonderful world of clean transportation. Um, sorry, I'm getting a message that's telling me that it's trying to reconnect and asking me if I have a stable connection. I don't know if you're seeing that as well. Awesome. So around the area of awareness and education, how do you help your clients understand like the financial, you know, advantages, you know, to adopting EVs? Because it can be expensive. It's a bit of, of an investment up front. So, you know, how, how do you go about that? Sure. And Maria, I just wanted to double check that you're hearing me okay, because I had a message there saying uh, it was trying to reconnect. Oh, here Are we go. Yeah. Maybe I'll ask that question again. Uh, it sure. looks like okay. it's good again. Good. All right. Um, so around the area of awareness and education, um, how do you help your clients understand uh, the financial at you know advantages uh, to EV adoption because it can be an investment it, it it can be costly so how do you go around that? Yeah, I'd say we we tackle this on sort of two different levels because um, you know so our work we're generally working for governments and utilities that are trying to figure out how they can what kind of a role they can play in this transition and how they can accelerate adoption of electric vehicles. Um, sometimes that's uh, within their own operations. Maybe it's a government or utility that has their own fleet of vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, private companies as well. 
And in those cases, sometimes we're helping them to develop a plan that uh, makes the case for investment in uh, electric vehicles. And it's all about getting a sense of, you know, what is it going to involve in terms of those upfront capital investments mm -hmm. for the vehicles and the charging infrastructure? Uh, but what's the prize at the end of the tunnel in terms of reduced operational costs? And I think for those fleet customers, uh, we're in luck because a lot of fleets, you know, do a lot of this kind of analysis and, and you know, using spreadsheets to look at the total cost of ownership. And, and that really helps make a pretty compelling case for electric vehicles. Um, but for the other side of the work, which is actually the, the majority of our work, um, is, is when we're helping governments and utilities understand the potential for transitioning to EVs region-wide, not just in their own uh, operations, but say for a provincial government, how do they accelerate adoption across the whole province? Mm -hmm. And there again, this question of awareness and understanding of the financial implications of switching to an EV are, are very important. We all know that EVs currently cost more upfront. They might save you in the long run, um, depending on you know what type of driving you do. Um, but average people are much less likely to use a spreadsheet to calculate their total cost of ownership. We know that personal vehicle decisions are a lot less uh, rational and, and scientific, you know, folks are looking at that upfront sticker price. And so I think beyond looking at just the total cost of ownership, that's certainly a part of the puzzle. Certainly, you know, governments across the country are, are doing their best to improve the awareness and, and uh, do a lot of education around those types of benefits of EVs. But at the same time, we know that that upfront cost is really an important barrier to adoption. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, for some of our clients, uh, whether it's governments at the federal level or provincial level, uh, things like financial incentives are a really important piece of the puzzle to help uh, deal with that upfront cost, at least temporarily while the cost of these vehicles is still, um, you know, significantly higher than uh, comparable gas powered vehicles. Definitely. Forecasting models, they can be, you know, region specific, you know, um, the, um, you know, Atlantic Canada can differ from Western Canada. Uh, how how can that be? Is it something to do with load profiles you you had mentioned uh, earlier? Yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of different things uh, yeah. at play here. I'd say um, you know I'll talk about load profiles in a minute, mm -hmm. but just in terms of the potential for adoption of of EVs in different parts of the country, um, you know I think that's where we look at you know what are some region specific barriers to adoption, and so that can be things like. Uh, whether we're focused on very urban env environments or more sort of rural areas, uh, which have very different implications in terms of charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people, their, their first reaction is to think that EVs are really a, a city thing and, right. and rural uh, folks would have a harder time. I, I actually disagree with that. I live on a farm. I think EVs are great for folks that live in rural areas because uh, we drive a lot. And so back to that economic argument, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of that mm -hmm potential long-term savings because every kilometer you drive, you're, you're saving a lot by switching to electric, uh, by, to an EV. Um, and it becomes just a question of, you know, how do we make sure that there's enough charging, public charging infrastructure to cover the longer distances that you might see in a rural environment. Contrast that with an urban environment where access to charging is much more complicated. If you live in a rural area, you probably have a driveway, uh, much less likely to be the case if you're in you know, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, places like that. Um, and so we do a lot of work with those local governments. Uh, and I'd say with those bigger cities, those challenges around access to charging are, are really top of mind. Um, and yeah, beyond that, there's also just questions about the demographics. And, and certainly, you know, at this stage in the game, we see that, uh, you know, with EVs being more expensive up front to buy, um, you, you know, certainly the hotspots for EV adoption are more the, the, the more affluent parts of the country. Um, and so factors like that can really have an impact on the potential for adoption. Um, but on the side of uh, low profiles, that's sort of the next step, especially when we're working with electric utilities that are trying to understand what are the implications for their operations? How much load is this going to represent for them going forward? Um, that's where we really need to take into account, you know, what are the travel patterns in different parts of the country? How far do people drive? Uh, climate certainly has a big impact as well because... Uh, at colder temperatures, EVs yeah. consume a lot more energy. Um, and so these are some of the important factors that we need to take into account uh, when figuring out what the, yeah, where and when do these vehicles charge and what does it mean for uh, the electric utility? 
no EV is the same. I mean, if you're comparing a fire truck or an ambulance uh, to, you know, a regular, you know, car that you and I would just drive. I mean, how do you help provincial and, and you know, federal municipal governments, you know, create these usage profiles? You know, I guess that's what we're kind of leaning into is no EV is the same, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you nailed it by speaking to some of those uh, commercial types of vehicles. I mean, I think for our personal vehicles, you know, my comments on the last question about load profiles, mm -hmm. um, maybe there's some variability from one place to the next, but generally speaking, most personal vehicles are doing some variation of driving to work and back a couple times a week, um, right. and then maybe going on the occasional long trip. And so there's variation in there for sure. But when you look at commercial vehicles, different types of trucks and buses, that's where the usage patterns begin to be uh, very specific and very unique. And it becomes really mm -hmm. important to consider those usage profiles carefully when assessing the potential for adoption of electric vehicles. Um, so we do that again when we're looking at the potential for adoption region-wide, maybe developing these load forecasts for an electric utility. We'll uh, take a close look at what, you know, what is the composition of the fleet in their service territory. Um, and also when we're working for an individual fleet, uh, for example, we do a lot of work for local governments and local governments have large fleets and they're very diverse. They have a lot of different types of vehicles. They have, you know, anything from a small passenger car that's doing parking enforcement all the way up to fire trucks and garbage, tr garbage mm -hmm. trucks and everything in between. And so we um, pay a lot of attention to how these vehicles are used. Uh, sometimes working with companies like Geotab that have uh, devices on the vehicles that collect uh, telematics data that tell you that can tell you a lot yeah. about uh, where and how much driving these vehicles do, and that can be really valuable for understanding a the potential for adoption of, uh, of an EV for a given application, understanding whether that vehicle is really suitable for replacement with an EV. Um, B, what the potential fuel savings would look like and how that compares to the upfront cost. Um, and crucially, also gives us a sense of what the energy demand of that vehicle will be. So for an individual fleet, that might be really critical to understand what kind of charging infrastructure they need to install in their facilities and what, how that might compare to their available electrical capacity. And at the utility scale, that's going to tell them a lot about, well, what's it going to be like when you know, 100% of the school buses and transit buses go electric over the next 10 years or so. And, and what is it going to look like when a, a warehouse supporting a fleet of 100 class eight semi trucks uh, goes electric? Um, that careful understanding of those usage pro profiles is really important to, uh, to perform that assessment of the overall energy demand for fleet electrification. So once you get all this data collected and you got your, you're crunching all the numbers and you're looking at all the, the reports, what does an EV strategy look like, you know, in, in general terms? Sure. Yeah, I'd say it, it really depends on um, the organization because, you know, we do work for um, electric utilities uh, for different levels of government, anywhere from city governments, uh, state and provincial governments, all the way up to the federal government. And we also do work for corporate organizations that are either looking to invest in the EV transition or that perhaps just for their own operations, they want to understand how to decarbonize their, their fleet. Um, so across the board, I think the, the, the common theme is that we need to understand the objectives. Right. In general, if it's an EV strategy, I assume the objective is going to be something along the lines of maximize adoption of EVs, either in our own operations or region-wide. And to do that, you really need to understand uh, what are the barriers to adoption of EVs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so there are a lot of things, you know, I think I, I try to strike a balance, you know, in general, I'm pretty optimistic about the potential for the switch to EVs. I think we're seeing a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you might see some headlines that are pretty uh, gloomy, but I think if you look at the numbers, it seems like uh, the trajectory is uh, obvious where we're seeing incredible growth in EV adoption. But I'd like to balance that optimism out with a, you know, a pretty clear eyed uh, appreciation of the, the real barriers that are holding, you know, still a significant portion of the population, like holding them back in terms of making that switch to an EV. Um, and so we do a lot of work to, to develop a really good understanding of what exactly are those barriers. And that's crucial to understand, you know, what are the steps that different levels of government or other organizations can take to address those barriers. 
Um, and, and, you know, different levels of government, for example, might have um, different strengths in terms of their position in the market and what kind of a role they can play. I would say, you know, city governments, they're really down on the ground, really in a good position to help grasp the specific barriers to charging in their specific environment. Uh, so they might understand, you know, what, what does the city look like? What are the different neighborhoods and where do people park and what types of public infrastructure might be useful in different areas? Um, whereas all the way at the other end of the spectrum, you know, the federal government, uh, we do a lot of work uh, in Canada for the federal government. And, you know, I wouldn't say they're in a good position to figure out exactly what charging stations should go where because, you know, they're not going to, they should be leaving that to folks who are down on the ground. But uh, they've got a really important role to play in terms of supporting things, uh, certainly from the financial side, providing funding for charging infrastructure. And also, you know, we mentioned earlier the, the role of financial rebates um, for oh, yeah. the purchase of EVs in the near term. And uh, yeah, provincial governments somewhere in between those two ends of the spectrum uh, have a lot of different roles they can play as well. And so I think it's it's a it's a matter of looking at and understanding those barriers to adoption, working with our clients to understand what's within their wheelhouse, what can they really uh, take on themselves, and using that, putting that all together to uh, to come up with a strategy that can really help to um, address those barriers. So a really good example is uh, last year. Uh, the Qu Quebec government announced an EV infrastructure well, strategy. And so we yeah. did all the analysis on that strategy to figure out what kind of infrastructure is needed, what's it going to take, and uh, yeah, help them focus their efforts and, uh, and appreciate the scale of ambition that's required. And so that strategy includes over $500 million of new funding for charging infrastructure. And so, you know, we have a lot of fun really helping them figure out how, how to make the most of their capacity and how they can have the the greatest impact. Awesome. Well, in December of 2023, Ella, we, we both know, you know, the federal government announced that by uh, 2035, you know, 100% full adoption of, of EVs in Canada. So what does this mean for utilities, let's say, and the grid and the infrastructure? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty um, substantial target to reach. What are your thoughts on that? I think, first of all, there, there's one point of confusion that I think is really important to address. And sometimes that target um, gets discussed and people misinterpret it mm -hmm. to think that that means that 100% of the vehicles on the road must be electric by right. 2035. That's but new sales or something, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And, and those are two very different mm -hmm. things. Uh, so that means that as of 2035, you can no longer buy a new gas-powered right. vehicle. But we'll still have gas-powered vehicles uh, on the road probably till about 2050. So as far as that planning goes for electric utilities, um, you know, some people ask the sort of the, the straw man argument, uh, can the grid handle uh, all, of the, all the vehicles being electric and almost suggesting like that's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, overnight? Uh, what's working in the, the favor of the electric utilities is that it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time. Um, even once we hit that target of 100% of new sales in 2035, uh, utilities will still have another 15 years or so before, you know, every vehicle on a driveway in Canada is, is going to be plugging into the grid. Um, but I don't want to underplay the challenge here. It is, it is pretty substantial, you know, uh, and um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done on the utility side. We work with utilities in uh, just about every province, uh, developing load forecast to understand, you know, how quickly is this load going to materialize? Uh, and if anything, those targets that have been adopted by the federal government really help electric utilities in terms of knowing what they need to plan for. I think until, you know, we've been doing this kind of forecasting since about 2018. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, you know, there are a lot of questions, you know, we would do our best to develop forecasts, but there was a lot of uncertainty as to whether this uh, trajectory was really going to happen. Now that you have a federal target that's locked in, it really helps um, the utilities and the decision makers at utilities and also the regulators that need to approve utility plans it helps them really uh, recognize that this transition is on its way and that we should be taking steps proactively to anticipate that. Um, but I would say in general, the, when we work with these utilities, they, um, you know, they're, they're challenges ahead. They're going to need to do some work in terms of um, expanding capacity in certain parts of the grid. Um, but if anything, they see EVs as honestly one of the easy challenges ahead of them because EVs are inherently very flexible. And what I mean by that is that... Um, you come home with an EV, you plug it in, uh, maybe at five or six p.m. Hi. 
Um, but you generally don't need a full charge until the next morning. And uh, with people typically driving about 40, 50, 60 kilometers a day, on a level two charger, you only need about an hour or two of charging per day. And so there's a mm -hmm. lot of flexibility in terms of when that charge can happen and a lot of potential for utilities to encourage off-peak charging. And if anything, turn EVs into a net benefit for the grid in terms of uh, increasing usage of, of the grid assets, uh, increasing the revenue for the utilities without necessarily driving higher costs. And it, looking a little bit further into the future, potentially even being able to leverage these EVs as a distributed form of energy storage. And so if utilities can figure out the right uh, programs and policies, they might be able to encourage uh, EV owners with some kind of financial incentive to allow the utility to tap into that energy storage during peak periods and, and help use that kind of storage to accommodate an increasing penetration of variable renewable sources of generation. So I think in general, I mean, it, the quick answer to this to me is go to just about any electric utility website in the country and you're likely to find some page on their website that tells you how awesome EVs are. Um, and that wouldn't be the case if utilities were really concerned about uh, the impact of EVs on the grid. I think overall they see a lot of potential here and it's just a question about of, uh, staying, ahead of, staying ahead of the curve and making sure they're prepared for this load growth as it, as it picks up. Awesome. I seem to have lost you there for a quick second, but I, you know, um, I'll just, we can edit this, but um, I think it's recording you and you're speaking and it's recording me in a separate track. So I think we're okay, but okay. well, great. Well, thank you. Yeah. And, and if ever, helps, I also set up my phone just to be um, recording me as well. Yeah. Uh, if ever you need a backup. That's great. That's good. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for, for speaking with me today again. And uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to make this yeah, happen. Absolutely. We're going to make this work. <laughs> you certainly, yeah. I, I, I love this topic about EVs and, uh, and, and, and I like the work that you're doing at Dunsky and what Duns Dunsky is doing as well. And, um, you know, we'd like to, we'll be meeting again for sure. We'll be crossing paths for sure. That sounds great. No, and thanks for the opportunity and thanks for putting a spotlight on this, on this topic. You're welcome. Okay, take care. That was Jeff Turner, Director of Mobility with Dunsky Energy and Climate Advisors, talking about EV adoption and strategy and everything else about the EV industry. Great conversation. Thanks for listening and joining in. This podcast is sponsored by Smart Energy. It's a energy conference that's held in Halifax, and Vancouver, and it's where people get together, academia, the industry, and also curious people who just want to learn more about what's going on in the energy world. We hope that you can register. I'm your host, Maria McGowan. Thanks for listening in today, and we'll see you or talk to you, or you can listen to me next time. Have a great day.